October 1901, Gross Point, Michigan. Henry, you'll have to clean the layer of dust from yourself before I kiss you. Good race, but you need a bath, said Clara. As Henry Ford stood in the cool dusk, he smiled a goodbye to his wife and turned toward the racer that had won him the 10-mile race. He expressed confidence before the race, telling a newspaperman, a fat man cannot run as fast as a thin man, but of course he didn't really know how it would turn out. Ford was 37 years old, slender, but with the strong hands and forearms of someone who worked with their hands regularly. He looked down at his clothing. Clara was right. He was a dusty mess. He reflexively began to brush some of the dust toward the ground and allowed a smile. He probably smelled bad too, some combination of the sweat that had soaked him during the race and the grease and oil he'd gained while working on the racer. The promoters had dubbed this day's event as the World Championship Sweepstakes, pulling together prize money for different types of automobiles and several races around the one-mile horse track here at Gross Point. The main event was the one he had just won, and along with the victory came a $1,000 prize, money he could very much use. But now he had a fuller sense of the other prize for the victory, his reputation. Perhaps fame as well? It was a two-car event, his racer against that of Alexander Winton, who was probably the best-known car maker in the country. He knew that his own reputation as a car man was established around Detroit, but probably not much further anyway. Yet. Winton's business was Winton Motor Carriage Company, and he'd first gotten notoriety four years earlier when he'd made the 800-mile trip from Cleveland to New York City in under 80 hours. Newspapers around the country reported the story. By the next year, he'd leveraged publicity from that trip into sales of something like 20 automobiles. And those sales kept increasing as he'd heard that Winton had sold more than 100 in the last year. Before the race, Winton had tested his beast of an automobile in a one-mile timed trial that came in at 1 minute, 12 seconds. That time was declared a new world record for speed by the announcer over his bullhorn with shouts and cheers from the grandstand full of curious people about these new machines. He'd watched Winton take turns at such a speed that his confidence wasn't high by the time of the start of the race. Three cars had made it to the starting post. His racer, Winton's, and a Pittsburgh sportsman named William Murray, who had bought one of Winton's heavy autos. But as they approached the starting line, the cylinder in Murray's engine had apparently burst as it was bleeding oil, and he had to withdraw. His own racer was in the shadow of Winton's, which must have weighed four or five times more. Winton had told him it had 70 horsepower, which he supposed was about double that of his. He'd asked his friend, Spider Huff, to ride along, but more as ballast than either passenger or mechanic. Spider rode on a running board he'd attached to the frame. As he went through turns, Spider would lean his body out as a counterweight while holding on to a pair of brackets to prevent the racer from leaving its inside wheels and tipping. The turns at high speed frightened him, but Spider seemed to enjoy it. If the racer had flipped, he'd expected Spider would have changed his mind. The race was originally to have been 25 miles, but as the event was running long and the shortening autumn daylight necessitated a change to the race of just 10 miles. Winton had burst to a distant lead to start the race. His racer was big and loud and communicated power, and he was better at taking turns at the beginning. But about halfway through the race, he and Spider had developed a better rhythm and more confidence. They closed the gap and eventually passed Winton. He was concentrating on driving, but couldn't help but appreciate the huge roar from the crowd as he finally passed him. Winton's car had begun to smoke heavily in the latter part of the race and was never able to close the gap. Thin man beats the fat man in a race, indeed. Before he could even pull his racer to a stop, he was surrounded by a mob. They stepped into the dust cloud that caught his car as it slowed. Way to go, Ford. Fastest man in the world. He'd spoken to some people he knew. Most he didn't, though. But the group that surrounded him for probably 20 minutes was made up of newspapermen. They all had pencils and pads as they practically shouted questions at him as fast as he could answer. And the reporters weren't just from the Michigan papers. This story was going to get some play. Someone approached from behind. Henry, that's a pretty sleek machine compared to our delivery trucks. 
The slight Irish lilt gave it away. He turned. Hiya, Billy. You didn't think my next machine would be anything so clunky, did you? William Billy Murphy was a Detroit lumberman who'd made it big, parlaying that business into many investments, including Detroit Automobile Company. His first automobile he'd built in the barn behind his house on nights and weekends, working during the day for Detroit Edison Electric Company. He'd finished what he called the quadricycle back in June 1896. With a two-cylinder engine, a bicycle seat, a wooden chassis, and bicycle tires on its spindly wheels, it was steered by a tiller and had a house bell as a horn. It weighed 500 pounds and had a top speed of about 20 miles per hour. It wasn't much, but it did attract attention, including that of Billy and others who'd invested in his first business. They'd built and sold some heavy delivery trucks, but neither himself or the investors were particularly happy with the trucks or with the potential for the business. So they'd shut the business down. The investors hadn't made money, but at least they hadn't lost too much either. I learned you didn't want to build delivery trucks anymore, that's for sure, Henry. Murphy walked to the racer, his finger tracing a line on the dusty hood. He was careful not to let his expensive suit rub against the racer. This is a long way from both your quadricycle and the delivery trucks you built. You told me a long time ago that building a decent automobile, you had to get away from a motorized carriage. This machine actually looks like something different. What's the weight? 1,600 pounds. How much horsepower? Are there multiple cylinders in the engine? He could only smile at Murphy's quick questions. He was still interested in the automobile. Between 25 and 30 horsepower from the engine. It's two-cylinder. He lifted the hood by a handle. There was a hinge at the top. He pointed to one of the cylinders. We developed this new piece at the top of the cylinder for ignition. It's encased in porcelain. A dentist rigged it up for us. That drew a laugh from Murphy. Ha! You'll make the doctors jealous if you don't give them some job. I feared the job for the doctors from today would be to mend my broken bones, Billy. We didn't get brakes put on, so there are only two ways to bring it to a stop. Roll or crash. I don't imagine that the racers will always have a guy hanging off the car like Spider was today. And they'll probably need brakes, too. He closed the hood and stepped toward the seat. Thanks for coming today, Billy. It's good to see you. Don't run off just yet, Henry. I want to pitch you on an idea. Let's start another business. But let's build real automobiles this time. Not delivery trucks. Something like what you always wanted to build. A lighter, faster one this time. Maybe not as fast as this racer, but something modeled after this. He couldn't help but cringe. Billy, you just shut down Detroit Automobile Company. Which seems right, since we didn't actually build any automobiles. You got all upset with me because I lost interest. What'd you tell me? Henry, you need to decide whether you're in or out of this business. Which is it? And you told me out, which I didn't like, but at least you were clear. We can do it different this time, Henry. Why not? Like I told you before, Billy, I like you and I think I can learn a lot about business from you. But I don't want to be just another guy who works for you. If I wanted a job, I should have stayed with Detroit Edison. I made more money and worked less for it. And I could work on my quadricycle nights and weekends. That gets to how we'll do it differently this time, Henry. I've got four other guys who will invest in a new business. But the five of us will share ownership with the business with you. Thanks to the prize money from today, I'm in a little better shape financially, Billy. But I can't invest alongside guys like you. No, Henry, that's not what I'm saying. We'll make you an owner in exchange for making an automobile. I don't have to put money into the business? No. Will I draw a salary? Of course. Modest before we start selling, but better after the business makes some money. And when the business makes money, would I share in that too? Of course. When the business pays dividends, all shareholders will participate. Hmm. Well, Billy, you're a good salesman. But you know, I've been thinking about my own business, and I'm not sure I'm cut out to be a partner with five other guys. I understand, Henry. I really do. But if you just tinker with racers, do you really think you'll build a working man's car you've always talked about? It may take you 20 years to build a decent-sized business all on your own. Do you think the world's going to stand still waiting for Henry Ford's automobile to be born? You've got to move, man. Let's do it together. Ah, oh, Billy, I'll give it some thought, but it doesn't feel right in my gut. To be in business together, I mean. Billy smiled broadly at him. See if this idea helps your gut feel better. The incorporation papers I filed on Friday were for a business named the Henry Ford Company. 
November 1901, New York City, New York. Henry Ford walked along 26th Street on a bright fall day. He'd been here before, but was still struck by the sheer number of people. No matter the time of day or night, people moved about, bumped into one another as they walked, and shouted at people they recognized. It was an ever-surging sea of humanity. An interesting place to visit, surely, but he was always thankful to return to Michigan. He gazed up at the massive building, Madison Square Garden. It had been built about 10 years ago and was one of the biggest, most elaborate exhibition spaces in the country, probably in the world. The bell tower in the middle of the structure was supposed to be the second tallest in the city, rising to over 30 stories above the street. He was here for the Madison Square Garden Automobile Show. The first one had been held one year prior. The prize money he'd won in last month's race had made the decision to travel easy. He could afford it. He also expected he would run into some of the newspapermen that had written about him in October. He kept feeding them his opinions if they kept putting his name in the papers. He paid his 50-cent entry fee and made his way into the barking, fuming, boisterous arena. The noise and the fumes were intense, but to him it wasn't a cacophony. It was the future. Imagine the streets of this great city filled with automobiles instead of horses. For the next few hours, he toured the exhibitions where cars were not only on display, but were trying to prove how they could move under their own power. Automobiles were started and stopped, run over obstacle courses, bumped over small bridges that had been constructed, and put through various tests. Some of the autos even managed to work. But the scene at many of the stations were of men leaning over or crawling under their automobiles trying to either diagnose or repair them. He sympathized. He heard someone call his name and looked in the direction of the shout. It was Alfred Sloan. Henry, come in. Henry opened the gate at the railing. This is a better place. Sit down with me and come see the show from a box seat. He knew Sloan because they'd done some business. Sloan's business was Hyatt Roller Bearings. He'd first used the Hyatt Bearings for the axles of the delivery wagons for Detroit Automobile Company, and then also bought them for the racer he'd built. I shouldn't be surprised to see you here, Alfred. Sloan was lean and tall, his suit cut to fit his many angles. Ford dealt more with his partner, Peter Steenstrup, who was the salesman for Hyatt, but he liked Sloan well enough. He was less outgoing than his partner, but seemed a good guy. He guessed that Sloan was the real brains behind the operation, even though he couldn't even be 30 years old yet. Most college boys like to brag about how smart they are, which always indicated to him that they were not. Sloan was different than that. He didn't have to brag about his smarts or anything else because he'd actually had talent and he worked to use it. Steenstrup was the one who bragged about Sloan's engineering degree from the Massachusetts Institute for Technology. Sloan had never mentioned it. They took a seat in front of the railing. Henry, I've come to read a couple articles about the racer you built. One had a picture of you next to it. It looks like a good machine. It was fast enough to win the race anyhow. I even got Hyatt bearings in the axles. He couldn't resist teasing the ever-serious Sloan. Is that what you and Peter are doing here, trying to get Hyatt bearings in all these autos? Not all of them necessarily, just the ones that will actually go on to build a real business. What's a real business, Alfred? Sloan grimaced. I shouldn't be too critical of automobile men. I'm banking on a big future for these machines. Ford could only smile at that. You and me are both banking on a big future for the automobile. Sloan took a moment to consider what he wanted to say. When Peter and I took over Hyatt, the business was just a mess. Nothing was in order. The bearings weren't of consistent quality. The responsibilities of managers weren't clearly defined. Processes for ordering, manufacturing, hiring, selling, shipping, none were defined with anything approaching regularity. There's only one thing that was consistent, that the business was losing money. The only question was how much would be lost. So Hyatt wasn't a real business, Ford asked? It was a business looking squarely at its extinction. It was nearly broke. Alfred, I'm not a very large customer, yet anyway. But it appears to me that Hyde is a well-recovered. How'd you turn it around? The first credit for turning the business around goes to my father. He's the one who purchased it and convinced me there was an opportunity to improve it. What did you improve? How long did it take? Having been part of one business that didn't work out, he was keen to tap into any insight Sloan might have. It needed order and coordination. I thought when I was younger that my skills were as a mechanic, perhaps like you, Henry. 
but I'm afraid I've left mechanical skills to wither. If they even existed in the first place. I'm more of a mechanic or engineer of men rather than machines. Get men to work together in coordinated regular ways and profitable business can be found, at least for Hyatt. Six months after Peter and I started to run the company, it became profitable. You make it all sound easy, Alfred. No, I don't mean to. We had to completely reorganize the production process. Peter and I at work from seven in the morning until six at night, six days of the week. Everything, everyone is a struggle. But Hyde is worth well more in value today than when your father bought it. Ford was very interested in this part of the business. Did he share ownership with you? Not at first. He provided all the money for the purchase, after all, and all the money needed to operate the business while it lost money. But as the business has profited, both Peter and I have gained ownership in the business. Does the business pay dividends from his profits? Do you share in those? Yes, the dividends are split according to ownership, so Peter and I have been paid the dividends. Though the dividends have only been 20 to 25% of profits, we've re reinvested most of the profits in a new building, new equipment, and additional labor. He couldn't help but be a bit envious. It must be nice to have your father be the source of capital for your business. It doesn't seem to me that most investors would be very open to increasing a man's ownership as the profits of the business grow. In my experience, they'd prefer to keep ownership and dividends for themselves. I provided the money, young man, they say. You provide the labor. Be content with your salary. Sloan could occasionally smile. Fair enough, Henry. I'm very fortunate to have a father who's provided an example of diligence in business, but also the money to buy Hyatt and provided Peter and I a start. His bet on us has paid off so far, but we also placed a bet on you, Henry. How have you bet on me? Well, just not on you, Henry rather on everyone working to make automobiles a commercial success. For the business appears to me as a mess. I've met hundreds of men like you, tinkering in barns, garages, and dirt-floored machine shops. Carriage makers, buggy builders, bicycle mechanics, wagon manufacturers, machine part makers, and... He pointed toward the cacophony of activity below them. The entire melange of undercapitalized entrepreneurs striking out in an attempt to build their dream machine to make their fortune, to make their everlasting fame. I'm betting that some number of them, perhaps you, Henry, will build the right automobile that will sell in the thousands, then tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands. He regarded Sloan. He was telling a story about the automobile that touched on the story that he told himself, but he had only shared with Clara so far. How about selling millions of automobiles, Alfred? Is that your plan, Henry? Perhaps Peter and I need to reconsider our expansion plans for Hyatt. We plan on making roller bearings for automobiles in the thousands, not the millions. Why, Alfred, you'll have a roller bearing empire, imagine. I can imagine a bigger Hyatt roller bearing company, but not an empire, Henry. The empires will be made building automobiles, not the ball bearings. March 1902, Detroit, Michigan. Mr. Ford, said a gaunt, white-bearded man who sat across from him, we are not going to part today without bringing matters fully to light. Henry Ford considered the man across the table, Henry Leland. If there were ever a man he liked less than Leland, he couldn't recall who that might be. What could describe him? Grim, he thought. He supposed he was about age 60, consistently acerbic with an overarching piousness that he alone had authority on all matters related to machines. But Ford had to admit that his annoying confidence and his engineering insight did arise from a credible record of accomplishment. People referred to the old man as the finest machinist in America. His Detroit shop, Leland and Faulkner, could cut parts to one one hundred thousandth of an inch. He was making a mark in building those precision ma machine parts for automobile engines. Specifically, Leland was building a one-cylinder engine for Ransom Olds. His Oldsmobiles were selling well with Leland's small engine that was squeezing out something like 10 horsepower. Mr. Leland, he replied, matching the formality, I don't know what matters you want to bring fully to light, but I have an engine to work on, and I haven't found our conversations helpful in that work. Your work doesn't appear to assist in getting that engine to work either. Another lecture was coming. I know you take great pride in your one-cylinder engine, and you should. It's a great success in an Oldsmobile, but it will not be in a Ford automobile. 
Ford and his chief mechanic had completed a prototype of a body for a car that was inspired by the racer he'd built the year prior, but their work on a two-cylinder engine was slower. I reported to Mr. Murphy and the other five owners of this company that my opinion of your engine prototype is not high. The design is needlessly complex. He smiled. And let me guess. Hmm. The company should drop my two-cylinder engine and use a one-cylinder model, which, oh, by the way, is manufactured by Leland and Faulkner. Am I on the right track, Mr. Leland? Don't be so offended. I recommend we use the body you've developed. Some improvements are needed, of course, even in that. But I told him it could be adequate. He drummed his fingers on the table. Adequate, eh? It warms my heart to have something I've built to gain such an endorsement from you. The owners of this company want an automobile that will sell, sooner rather than later. Without a workable engine, you cannot even point to a sales date. I am an owner of this company too, and a two-cylinder engine of my design is what will power a Ford automobile. You are a one-sixth owner, that is true, but Mr. Murphy and the other four are five-sixth owners of the company, and they've instructed me to move forward with preparation of a one-cylinder model sale with due haste. He groaned in exasperation. <sighs> Things have come to this point so quickly that my so-called partner send another man to consign me to the back bench. Mr. Ford, either you avoid them or ignore them. Don't act surprised. You are young but no fool. My observation from the start is that you did not want to be a part of this business. Your efforts have been half-hearted. Instead of focusing on building an automobile, you turn your attention to more racing contests, for example. Those races bring this business publicity that is worth more than what's been invested by Billy Murphy and the others. They do bring publicity, I will grant you that. But the publicity is for you, Mr. Ford, not this business. He rose. You are partly right, Mr. Leland. I did originally want to be a part of this business. Billy told me I would be an equal partner. But this isn't the way I think about being an equal partner, so I will take my leave. Since you are apparently the conduit for communication between myself, Billy, and the others, I will send you with a message for them. I expect to have my one-sixth ownership share purchased by them, and it will reflect the value of the automobile that I've developed that will be used with your one-cylinder engine. I will communicate that by the end of day. Will that be all? He was walking away, but stopped and turned back towards Leland. Yes, one more thing. My name will be removed from the masthead of the business. Henry Ford's second, sort of, failed startup. The Ford Motor Company, as we know it today, was Henry Ford's third automobile startup. The second startup business, the first to use Ford in its name, only had Henry Ford working there for a period of months before he left in March 1902. He was indeed frustrated with investors, but they were frustrated with him too, and with good reason. Ford had dithered in his work and had shown every sign of disinterest that quickly shook the business confidence of Billy Murphy and the other investors that he was the right guy to lead the business. His work on the prototypes was unsteady. The engine he was working on didn't appear commercially feasible, and he maintained a weird continuing interest in racing. Ford would later write about his time at the company, I could get no real support toward making better cars to sell for the public at large. The whole thought was to make to order and get to the largest price possible for our car. And being without authority other than my engineering position gave me, I found that the new company was not a vehicle for realizing my ideal, but merely a money-making concern that did not make much money. In March 1902, he wrote, I resigned, determined never again to put myself under orders. Henry Ford reached an agreement with Billy Murphy and the other owners to have his one-sixth ownership share bought out at $900. That number doesn't seem like much today, but it could support Ford and his family for many months while he worked towards his third startup. That third startup business, Ford Motor Company, would be the organization that enabled Henry Ford to build his dream automobile for the masses, the Model T. But even that would come with struggles that reflect the tension between risk capital and entrepreneurs. Ford's investors, like investors of any age, wanted to get the most bang for their bucks. If they put up all the risk capital, their logic went, why should the entrepreneur Henry Ford share an ownership? Risk capital is of primary importance. Entrepreneurial talent is secondary. Part of what venture capital investing in the United States has pioneered is to overturn this order. Entrepreneurial talent is primary. 
risk capital is secondary. Venture capital funds have fiduciary responsibility to make returns for investors, but they understand that without entrepreneurial talent, there will be no returns. Capitalization tables, or cap tables in industry jargon, are detailed pictures of the equity ownership of the business. Henry Ford's place on the cap table of the Henry Ford Company reflected a 16.7% ownership stake, and five other owners with the same. The other five owners put in cash, and Ford put in his time and talent. As it turns out, Ford thought his time and talent were worth much more than 16.7%. Modern angel and venture capital investors would agree. If you find prime entrepreneurial talent, give them as much incentive as possible to work night and day to make their business grow. Peter Thiel was the first investor in Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook. $500,000 for a 10% stake in the business, which Thiel has called his best investment. He saw something in the young Zuckerberg that proved accurate. How to find the young Henry Fords to invest in their business? A good question. How to become an entrepreneur with the impact of Henry Ford? An even better question. Henry Ford was a complex person, as are most high-impact entrepreneurs, but you'll be able to learn the rest of the story in my upcoming book, The Entrepreneur's Ethic, and do a deeper dive on his journey. There are seven parts of The Entrepreneur's Ethic. Ford's work exemplifies Ethic 2, Solve Hard Problems. This is the priority setting orientation of entrepreneurship, answering the profound question of, what should I work on? Late in his life, Henry Ford made a comment to someone asking him about the bygone era. Young man, he snapped, I invented the modern age. Ford had a considerable ego, obviously. But to understand Henry Ford's impact, particularly through development of the Model T, is to understand the advent of a new age an age that largely remains intact today. The known world to many people prior to Ford, especially in rural areas, was the 10 to 20 miles around which they lived and had likely been born. That was it. Development of the railroad had made long distance transportation a much more feasible reality for some, but most people didn't wander far from the home very often, if at all. Today, the average American family owns two cars, about one-third of American families own three or more. The farm families that Henry Ford thought he could make into Ford customers, though now not a large part of the population today, are the most prolific car and truck owners of any group at all. Think of what's here today that's designed for the cars. Cities, interstates, highways, drive-ins, drive throughs drive-ups, hotels, motels. Zoning laws lay out how many parking spaces are required for certain types of buildings. Speed laws regulate how fast we are supposed to drive. Federal laws regulate how much gasoline should be used for automobile manufacturers in their vehicles. State laws require a license to drive. But you can drive before you can vote and before you can drink. Never lend your car to anyone to whom you have given birth, said Irma Bombeck. Have you ever noticed that anybody driving slower than you is an idiot? And anyone going faster than you is a maniac, said George Carlin. When a man opens a car for his wife, it's either a new car or a new wife, said another comic. Cars are part of the culture, and we can point back to Henry Ford's work in the first years of the 20th century for what got it all started. Oh, one more thing. Henry Leland did talk the investors in the Henry Ford Company into using his one-cylinder engine in an automobile and they did agree to change the name of the business. They aimed for the luxury market that Henry Ford disliked, so used the name of a posh Detroit hotel for the company name Cadillac. Eventually, that company and brand became an important part of what another automobile pioneer, Alfred Sloan, put together while leading General Motors. The same Alfred Sloan that Henry Ford indeed had met at an automobile show at Madison Square Garden in November 1901, who would go on to become his competitive nemesis as the automobile matured in the 1920s and 1930s. And the same Alfred Sloan that endowed a program at his alma mater, MIT, now called the Sloan School of Management. Henry Leland sold Cadillac to General Motors in 1909 for $4.5 million and continued working there until 1917. Eventually, he would start a company called Lincoln Motor Company. When that company became insolvent in 1922 during recessionary times, it was purchased by Henry Ford's Ford Motor Company when Ford reportedly lowballed his offer as revenge against Leland's role in the original creation of Cadillac. 
In one of history's interesting entrepreneurial ironies, Ford needed Lincoln to compete against General Motors' Cadillac. <laughs>